Diving and snorkeling in the Indian and Pacific Oceans really led me to discover that we don't have just one world before us, but indeed we have two. Not one, that's two. So the oceans, they really do play a crucial role in regulating our planet's health, providing us with a wealth of resources and being a super highway for the global economy. I really do believe that out there is a new world to discover. Out there is a new world to explore. And out there is our future, our destiny. And out there will we discover the infinite beauty of our planet and how we can save people's lives, how we can help people. And that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about today. So that was a bit of an awe moment for you over there on the screen. That was, uh, yeah, there you go. That was in 2018 where I was diving in the Seychelles, so just off the coast of Africa. And my God, what an experience it was. So what I often like to think about is how much of our planet is covered by water? It's 70%. 70% of our planet is covered by the oceans. And I really just want to test quickly, how many of you think how much of it we've mapped? Okay. So put your hands up if you think it's 100%. Be honest, please. Okay, um, let's try 80. 80. What about 60? Okay, more hands there. 40. Well, the answer is actually 20. That's how much we know about our ocean. 20%, all right? And we're sitting here, what's funny is we're sitting here in this talk, 20% of our ocean's map, and meanwhile, we have a completed map of Mars, completed, Earth's moon, and Venus. That's not on our planet last time I checked. That's out there in the expanse of the universe. We're living on Earth. We don't know enough about our own planet. We have not collected the right data for the right reasons. And I'll tell you all about it. I think it's a bit of a case of NIMBY, so not in my backyard. We can always look up to the skies. We can see the heavens. But can we look to the ocean? A lot of us don't live within the vicinity of the ocean. A lot of people do, but not, not your average person. And I think that's an issue because we don't see it. We don't think about it. We use our oceans as, as, as a garbage bin, as a garbage can, however you want to call it. And I think that's preposterous. I really do think so. And I think it's time for a revolution, it's time for a change in our mindsets about how we think about our oceans and how we take effect. So even if you think about the value of our seas, if you were to take all the marine assets that we think about, so mangroves, kelp forests, coral reefs, trade routes, maybe carbon sequestration, so that's the act of sucking in carbon from the atmosphere. Because remember, the oceans are the number one carbon sink on our entire planet. And yet, you didn't, probably didn't know that until just now. If you combine all those assets together into the sort of economic value of the seas, it would be equivalent, the oceans, if they were a country, would be equivalent to being the seventh largest economy on our planet. Now you tell me that that is not valuable. But the problem is, right, all of that value, the two and a half trillion dollars, not billion, trillion, that depends on the oceans being healthy, them being clean, because at the end of the day, people rely on our oceans. That's about three billion people rely on our oceans for their livelihoods income, jobs, tourism, activities, all these things. And for example, if we look at mangroves, the Sundarbans region in the Bay of Bengal, fantastic, it's beautiful. That is our planet right there. That's not the moon, that's not Mars, that's Earth. And that blue thing there, that's our ocean, if you didn't know. And really, it provides a significant source of income, as I said, job security, food, and best of all, protection against coastal hazards, storm surges, hurricanes, even Tsunamis, that's what they do. And I want to talk about where our oxygen comes from. Not that plankton, it's actually this one. They're marine photosynthesizers, small, very small animals that really are very important. We, again, a case of NIMBY, we don't see them. But really, I want all of you to take two breaths right now. Okay, and then another one. Okay, they produce 50% of our, of our oxygen. So you can, thank one of the, you can thank them for at least one of those breaths. You're welcome on behalf of them. But really, again, if we think about coral reefs, these assets, bear in mind, to the economic value of our seas, the picture on the left is a very healthy coral reef, actually. But on the right, it's been bleached. What that is is the algae that give it that beautiful color, that give it the biodiversity that people depend on, generations of people depend on, and will do so for many years. The algae leave because the conditions are too harsh for them to stay there. They leave and 
I think this is quite analogous to the sort of, they're sort of the lungs of the ocean because them as well as the, the plankton give us our oxygen. And isn't that equivalent to what a smoker's lungs may look like? So we take care of ourselves. We make sure that we take the right precautions. We do things in moderation, but we let this happen to our planet. Why? Why have we done that? And I really do believe that why, okay, why should you care? Honestly, why should you care? Why are you listening to me? For all I know, many of you think that our species is destined for the stars. We're going to become an interplanetary species. We're going to colonize the moon. We're going to colonize Mars. But we can't just up and go and leave. We, look what we've done to the planet. Honestly, it's not something that we see every day, these kind of images. I could show us, but I won't. And I think that there are, we don't just share this planet, we're not the only occupants of this planet. We share this planet with nine million other species, by the way, and we owe it to them. It is our responsibility to fix the problems that we've caused and to actually give something back to our planet because we've taken too much. If you think about where our energy comes from, well, last year alone, 30% of this country, the United Kingdom's energy, came from offshore wind. Now, offshore wind is very powerful. It's a little bit better than onshore wind because of the great wind speeds at sea. And without the data, the data that we've collected of the seabed, we wouldn't be able to know where to put them in the sea. Well, you've got to know where to put something to actually put it there, don't you? I mean, that's the whole point of surveillance, operations, maintenance. That's why the industry exists. And there have been estimations that in the next 25 years, sorry, in the next seven years, there'll be a 25-fold increase in the use and the scale growth of offshore wind energy. Mark my words. And that gives us an indication. The sea floor, it's very dynamic. It changes quite a lot. Until a few days ago, I didn't know that this picture existed. Surprising for a geophysicist at Imperial. But it's beautiful. Look at that. You have caverns, you have trenches, you have underwater mountains and volcanoes. Beautiful scenery, but we don't see it, do we? It's all underwater. If only people knew about the beauty of what lies underneath the, that massive water column. This really does define, again, the sort of risks that we face against coastal hazards, as I mentioned. And one of those risks are tsunamis. So in the geology world, when you have plates that, tectonic plates, that is, that slip against each other, or they, one gets subducted underneath the other, that creates seismic activity. And that depends very much on the shape of the seafloor, the morphology, we call it. And whether or not there is, there's a fault there, we don't know. How do we do that? We map the seafloor, we collect data, very important geological and geophysical data as to whether there are faults there or not. That has the potential to save a lot of lives. If we cast our minds back to the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004, unfortunately, a quarter of a million lives were lost. And why, you ask? Because we did not prepare them enough. We did not have the data to tell them that there was going to be such an event. Even an hour is enough to save lives. I tell you this, the key sort of characteristics of saving people's lives, prediction, preparation, management. Prediction is very difficult. Management, it can happen. But preparation, I think that we can do that. We can do that if we have the insights to do so. And I think, just think how many lives we could have saved if we had that data. Because even a small chance, right? Even a small chance is all we need. If you think about the power of this earthquake, this is from my seismology class. This earthquake where it was so powerful, it went around the world four times. There's one, there's another reading, there's another reading, oh wait, and there's another. Four times, it's that powerful. We could have saved people from that event. Look how powerful it was. A chance is all we need. And if that means collecting the right data, getting the right insights, mapping out what could happen, past, present, and future, then we will do it because that's what humans are good at doing. We're good at solving problems. That's why we're all here. Look at the technology around us. We're good at solving problems. Why can't we solve this? Why can't we adapt? Why can't we evolve? Why can't we stop ignoring these problems? It's really important. And I think going back to the sort of the people who depend on the ocean, it's about three billion people, and mostly in developing countries. I think a lot of us take advantage of our environments. We take advantage of the oceans. But we mustn't forget that people depend on it. It's their source of income. It's their source of, it's their livelihoods. It's their source of culture and inspiration. Some people would, they wouldn't be themselves if it wasn't for the ocean. And 
Why is that? Because people can work in the tourism sector, they can work in the fisheries sector, aquaculture, in the offshore wind sector. There's people building turbines as we speak, but we don't think about them every day. And I think we need to collect the right data to enable these people to keep living their lives, to keep depending on the ocean. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. You enjoy it and you keep living how you're meant to live. And we'll enable that sort of, that culture and inspire people in such a way by collecting that data. So where did ocean exploration really come from? Why, what's been doing it for us? Well, it really started in the 60s when you have geoscientists like Murray Tharp and Bruce Heason who are trying to map these underwater earthquakes just like the Boxing Day tsunami, uh, the earthquake that caused the Boxing Day tsunami. And they created this. Is this, what, what would you call this? Anyone shout word? A map? That's a good idea. It does look like a map. And whilst it is a fantastic piece of work, at best it's, an, it's a piece of educated guesswork. Because all the lines that you can see, the supposed mid-Atlantic ridges and all that, that's just where the ship went. Collecting ocean data is very difficult. It's a very challenging sector. Very reliable ocean data is very scarce. It's difficult, it's expensive, it's time consuming. People don't want to do it. Is it a culture thing? Is it heaven and hell? I don't know. And well, luckily, thanks to advances in modern mapping technology, ocean robotics, we can get images like these from the British Antarctic Survey. And what we have are technologies such as the multi-beam echo sounder. It's a type of sonar that sends acoustic pings through the water and matches the return time to see what the surface looks like. And it's through this data and through this sort of, this characterization of our environments can we actually do things. How do you think we've been able to build all our buildings, we can build our theme parks, we can build our universities, how? Because we've surveyed the area. Is it the right place to put something there? Is it the right place to build something? Well, we only know that if we survey the area, right? Is it the right place for conservation? Remote sensing is one of the things that I'm specializing in, and that is observing worlds, whether it's ours or not, just away, <laughs> using satellites, using robots, and that's very powerful. Luckily, we are moving to a more autonomous future. And this is something that I carry very personally with me. I love it. So before, we used to map the seafloor with vehicles like those at the top. They're expensive, £200,000 a day to charter. Now, I definitely don't have that money, so I'm not going to spend that money doing that when I could adopt a more autonomous solution. And these solutions, they can be net zero. There are even startups today that are working on fuel cell-powered ones. They don't give off any emissions. The only things that they give off are heat and water. That's fine. And I think it's, it's much cheaper. It's more reliable. You don't need as many people doing it. And if we can send all these swarms of vehicles out, we'll get it done faster. That's what we want. We, more, what, we want more information faster. What are we waiting around for? And I think we really need to connect ourselves to the indigenous communities around the world. For they are really the ones who have known these environments for hundreds of thousands of years, and they'll continue to do so. It's called traditional ecological knowledge. That's the power of working with, uh, of working with traditional communities. We need to leverage that. We need to disseminate information, educate people on the power of the oceans, why it's so important. What technology are we using to do that? Why is the data important? You've seen that the data is important because we can save people's lives. We can get an idea of what resources are down there. We can get an idea of Maybe how we can help people to flourish. Maybe we can improve the biodiversity in, in, in the area. That comes from better data. Data is everywhere. Why don't we leverage it for the right things in the most prominent environment on our planet? And I think that this sort of age of exponential innovation, it's, if you look in just the right places, you will find a place where everything comes together. People can benefit. The environment can benefit as well. And that place is exactly what I've been talking about, the oceans. And I think, I think we just need to open our eyes to this new age of exploration. And I mean, it's only human to explore, am I right? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.